This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 128 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have some different kind of productions here. We've got a, a guy who's really working on animal welfare, and then we've got guys that are on the ground working with horses. This is Debbie Lauks, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, as always, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Hello, Debbie. Uh, How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. Hanging out here. It's been a nonstop recording day for me, and I love it when I get you on days where I just am basically glued to my earphones because... It's such a great, positive, energetic show to record. I You're love it. so nice. Thank you. Yes. We sure have fun doing it, don't we? We do. It's, it's, yeah. it's the positive energy aspect of it is really uplifting. It's hard to listen to the horsemanship radio show and not feel uplifted when you're done. It's just, it oh my gosh. Thank you very much. You're Merry welcome. Christmas. That was really nice. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> that was really nice. Well, thank you. I, I actually, I think we seek out people that do that for us because like on this show, we've got Marty Irby who has now, he's just become CEO of his own animal welfare organization, but he's kind of come up through the ranks of big ones and he's made huge changes in the equine world. And then we've got Monty Roberts, we've got dad and Jamie Jennings from the horse, horses in the morning show to tell us a little bit about spending a couple of days together working with a Mustang. Now, how good does that get? To me, this is really fun stuff. We're starting to sound like a Mustang makeover podcast ourselves, but, <laughs> but, it's, but we, it's a, I think overall it's a very uplifting and energetic episode overall. Yes. I think so too. I think so too. And, and I think people are going to enjoy it and I've got some fresh news. You want to hear like fresh, fresh, fresh news? Yes, fresh, 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 hot off the presses. What have you got? Yes. And it, and it ties into the interview that we did with Monty Roberts and Jamie Jennings. So I heard yesterday that we have a production called The Movement, and in it, it's we submitted this to the Equus International Film Festival as a series because we had this event last May, we're going to have another one in April, called The Movement, and it's Demonstrations, Discoveries, and Pathways. And we had these different speakers and different demonstrations in the round pins and the gentling pins with mostly the rock star is Diego. Diego Diego was this really wild Mustang who demonstrates that if you just are fair to a Mustang, they're so smart and they're such survivalists that they will come to understand and then trust and actually do amazing things for you that, you know, the, the lesson horse won't do sometimes out there for your child. <laughs> now, you know? Isn't, isn't Diego the one who went with the viral video? Yeah. Yes, Diego has a viral video out there. I'm sure a lot of folks have watched him. So you you did you you did filming during the 2018 the movement. That's right. And you exactly. put that all together and you produced it into a little mini series. That's how right. many episodes are there? I think there's 11 and 11 it's, episodes. it's on Vimeo. Let me look back on here. Yes, it's 11 uh, because at the end we have a panel discussion and a Q&A with all the presenters. It's really good. And, and let's see, there is, I think there's at least two on Diego on here. So good. And we had Hannah Selleck, that's Tom Selleck's daughter, who's a great horsewoman in her, on her, in her own right in training. And then Christy Cappert, uh, Christy Schulte Cappert, who is with the Ride Horse Initiative. They did their very first join ups they were so brave with Monty in the round pin yeah in front of everybody you know it was really it was really fun but you really get to you know the dialogue was amazing hearing these super experienced horse people experience their first join up and so yeah it's a lot of fun so it's on Vimeo it's vimeo.com and it's an on demand and it's file number 152412 which doesn't mean a lot but if you go to vimeo.com forward slash on demand, forward slash 152412, you will find the series. And that is the finalist in, I'm hoping, I must be, you know, 
wishing it into existence, but they've been officially selected as the finals for the three, three best of award categories. You ready? Best series, best training and best film representing the horse human bond. Is that awesome? Wow. Oh my gosh. So that's the 2019 Equus International Film Festival. And that'll be held March 14 through 17 at the Roxy Theater in Missoula, Montana. It's cool. Really oh, and I fun. just I just went to Vimeo. Yeah. And I typed into the search bar at the very top of the page, Monty Roberts. And okay. that's when it popped up right up to the top, the movement oh, 2018 sim- symposium. Oh, easy peasy. Thank you, Jen. That's great. That's a better way to do it than than instead of all those numbers. It's so a yeah. Lot of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> numbers into, I was thinking the show notes might help, but that's better. So you went oh, to Vimeo.com I, I, and put Hey, Bonnie Roberts. Roberts backstage passes on there too. Yes, that's true. And that is those are episodes that we put on in the UK and in on rural TV in Canada. And then now um also horse and country TV in the US. So people cool. can watch on there if they get that they get access to that too. So yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of, yeah. a lot of rock star stuff here going on. I'm really yeah, well, excited. We'll, we'll make sure we put a link to that on the show notes page for this episode, number 128 on uh, horsemanshipradio.com. That's it. Thank you very much for saying Perfect. that. Perfect. Radio.com episode 128. Shall we get into these interviews we've been teasing about? Let's welcome Marty to the show right after we hear from our good friends at Omega Fields. <laughs> Hi, Joe Camp here to share about Omega Fields. Omega Fields exists to help you keep your first promise to the horses you love, to care for them well. Nutrition is the foundation of a healthy life and supports all the activity that brings you and your horse so much joy. Omega-3s from flax are the cornerstone of that foundation. So, coupled with the finest ingredients and their proprietary pure glean flax stabilization process, they created Omega Horseshine, Omega Horseshine Complete, Omega Nibblers, Low Sugar and Starch, Omega Antioxidant, and Proventum Probiotic Soft Treats. Thousands of horses are experiencing a vibrant life with the help of Omega Fields products, including all of ours, a part of helping you keep your promise to your friends. Nutrition for a healthy life isn't just their slogan. It's their purpose. Marty Irby began riding Tennessee walking horses at the age of three and showed for the first time at the 1984 Trainers Show in Atlanta, Georgia, aboard Carbon Princess. In 2006, Marty won his first World Grand Championship in the English Trail Pleasure Division aboard the Lady of the Ritz and has also won seven additional world titles in Western Trail Pleasure and a full paid college scholarship to the University of South Alabama, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in community. Communication. This has served him well because Marty is now an advocate for equine protection and a member of Friends of Sound Horses, FOSH. Marty Irby is the executive director of Animal Wellness Action, where he serves as its chief lobbyist in Washington, D.C. Well, welcome, Marty Irby. Glad to have you back on Horsemanship Radio. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me again, Debbie. Uh, it's good to hear that Tennessee accent. That's wonderful. Or is it Alabama? Tell me which, where, where were you Alabama. born? It's Alabama. It's <laughs> Alabama. Yeah, that's right. Born in Mobile, Alabama. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, we met in Tennessee. That's right. It was, it's been probably about, gosh, almost 15 years ago now, I think. Is that right? Marty. Yeah. We don't get old, though. Time no, flies. No. <laughs> it does. <laughs> that's right. It does. And you really have traveled a big arc around the Tennessee Walking Horses, and that's why we wanted to have you back. I think the last time we had you here, you were another iteration of yourself again from when we first met. Why don't you tell people a little bit about where we met and and what you were showing flat shods, I know, at the time, flat shod Tennessee Walking Horses. Tell us a little bit about what you love about Tennessee Walking Horses, because I think that's how I first met you. Yeah, absolutely. No, we met um, in the early 2000s when I was the director of sales and marketing at Waterfall Farms in Shelbyville, Tennessee, and that was a Tennessee walking horse breeding farm that was owned by the founder of Ritz-Carlton, a gentleman named Bill Johnson, and Debbie and her dad, Monty Roberts, were so great to come work with us and try to help reform some of the people in the industry who had been practicing soaring, which is the intentional infliction of pain to horses' limbs to get them to perform an exaggerated gait known as the big lick. And so Monty worked with us for, I believe, over a year. It might have even been two years. And we just learned so much from him about natural horsemanship and 
how to properly take care of the horses. And it did help a lot of people in the walking horse industry. And unfortunately, though, uh, the trainers in that industry just seem so stubborn to continue mm-hmm. to want to soar horses. And I uh, remember in 2006, I think you might have been there when I won the Trail Pleasure World Grand Championship. I did, Which was yes. with a flat shot. That's right. right. Uh, the Lady of the Ritz was her name. That's and right. she was a sound flat shot horse that didn't have the big shoes and chains on. And I had been showing for about, gosh, I think at that point, I'd probably been showing for about 22 years. I started when I was mm-hmm. four years old and had won a few world championships, but that was my first and only actually world grand championship. So you were there to witness that. And I, oh, I can, I can verify yeah. it. It was a beautiful thing, beautiful horse, beautiful ride. It was really exciting. And it was Fun to see that natural gait. Tell us a little bit about it. People sometimes don't know that there are gated horses that really have a natural ability to, well, I mean, we know what it feels like in the saddle, you and I, which it's like glass. And I think I rode yeah. my first real well-trained Tennessee walking horse there, right there at Waterfall Farms under your tutelage. But tell us a little bit about why that gait is just so special and inborn. Well, it is. It's a natural gait. Um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the first walking horse was a horse named Alan F1. Um, that's his registration number. And he had a unique gait that no other horse had and no one had seen. And the horse had a shake to his head. He nodded his head up and down and mm-hmm. would stride with his back legs and had a little bit of a step to his front, but not not much to his front end. And just had a very smooth gait. So he was somewhere halfway in between a pacer and a a trotter, I would say, and had the smooth gait that we call the glide ride um, that the Tennessee walking horse is known for and the flat walk and running walk. He was the foundation side for the breed. The breed grew from there and that still inherent natural gait exists today, probably a hundred years later or more. And many of the people who ride the sound flat shot walking horses love them as trail horses, versatility horses. They perform in endurance circles and are just a tremendous breed. So docile, such a great horse. I grew up with them, of course, as Debbie knows, and uh, love the breed so much. It's just, in my mind, the best breed of horse out there. No, I don't blame you at all. And yeah, they're, they're sensitive enough that you, you know, it's really fun to ride, but they're also just so agreeable. They're just, I mean, I can't believe some of the things we ask them to do and yet they, you know, remain compliant. I don't know if that's the sensitivity bred out of them at this point, you know, like oversensitivity where they'd fight or um, it's just you know, the the bloodlines. You, you did something really right uh, in bringing up the, the Tennessee walking horses, which is a fairly new breed, if you think about it. In, in some ways, you know, it doesn't go back 400 years like the uh, That's right. Spanish. Yeah, 1935 yeah. is when the breed was established. The there you registry. go. Yeah. And that's really interesting. So, so why did you leave all that? I mean, here you were, you had a, a great job and, and all that. What, what was the impetus? I think I know, but let's, let's let the listeners yeah. in on it a little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, so for many years I showed walking horses and then like, like I said earlier, Debbie was witnessed, um, my world grand championship and I began to become more involved on the political side of things in the walking horse industry and served in several roles uh, on the national board and as a vice president of the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Association, which is the breed registry that was founded in 1935 in Lewisburg, Tennessee. And in 2010, a group of the people involved in the industry who were much more mindful of the issues of soaring and wanted to change things convinced me the night before the election to run for president from the floor. Mm -hmm. And I did, and I won. (laughs) And I had no clue what I was going to do about things, but I knew I wanted to change things and really make a difference. And so for that two-year period, I tried uh, from within to change things and honestly didn't have much success because there's such a mentality uh, of the trainers there that they don't want to change anything and stop using these big shoes that they have on the horses called stacks and chains around their ankles. And so during the time that I was president, Humane Society of the United States had been working on an undercover expose of a big lick walking horse trainer named Jackie McConnell. He was in Collierville, Tennessee, and I had been behind the scenes working with the Humane Society and was friends with the president of the Humane Society then, Wayne Paselli and Keith Dane, who headed up the equine department. 
and the expose came out on that trainer on ABC Nightline while I was president, and I was in Germany judging a walking horse show where they don't allow any of this that I've described, soaring stacks or chains, and sort of got to see the world's reaction to that Mm -hmm. and decided it was time to make a very rapid change Mm -hmm. and that we couldn't wait around and and try to uh, improve things with incremental change that Mm -hmm. had seemed to fail, and we had tried it. And so uh, I publicly came out in support of federal legislation known as the Prevent All Soaring Tactics Past Act, which Mm -hmm. had been introduced by Congressman Ed Whitfield from Kentucky and Congressman Steve Cohen from Tennessee. And I still, to this day, am working on that legislation about six years later, and hopefully we will pass it one day. That's right. I think that's mostly awareness, isn't it? I mean, why wouldn't people pass it? It is. So we actually just reached this past week 290 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives Mm -hmm. And what's significant about that is that two-thirds of the House and under the new rules going into the new Congress in 2019, there's a provision that would allow for a bill with 290 members of the House that are co-sponsors to automatically be brought to the floor for debate and a vote. And so we're looking forward to the opportunity to potentially have it come to a vote in 2019. It's been blocked over the past five or six years by a small group of Republicans from Kentucky and Tennessee particularly Marsha Blackburn, who was a congresswoman that just was elected to the U.S. Senate in -hmm. Tennessee and several others. But uh, now that she's no longer in the House of Representatives and the Democrats have taken over in the majority, I feel like we have a much better chance than we've ever had. Good. Well, that's great. I mean, I don't know all the politics of it, but I know the darn thing hasn't passed yet. (laughs) And we need to we need to support that. However, listeners feel that they can. Um, And I I don't want to end it there because we're, we're not a wrap up for any kind of politics here. But but what would you say if you're a horse lover, what can they do? Well, I think if you're a horse lover, the most important thing that they could do is call 202. 224-3121, and that's the U.S. Capitol switchboard, and ask for your member of Congress. They'll typically ask for your address and connect with your member of Congress and ask them to co-sponsor the Prevent All Soaring Tactics Act and urge the leadership in both the House and the Senate to move that legislation to the floor for a vote. And your calls and emails will matter. They make a huge difference. Members of Congress do listen to their constituents, and that's why we have 290 co-sponsors today. Yeah, that's a lot. It seems like a lot. Is that the most you've had now in this whole journey? We had 308 in the first Ooh. Congress, but we had a little more time um, from the introduction to the end of the Congress than we've had go around. We probably will add a few more in the next few weeks before the Congress ends, but there's no other piece of legislation related to animal protection on any species of any kind that has the amount of support Mm. for it that the PAST Act does. Wow, that's a big stat, I would think. There's a lot of causes out there, so that's that's pretty amazing. Okay, I I have a lot of hope. Uh, I always had hope in you, Marty, (laughs) but, uh, you know— we, some of us are impatient and I, and I know, and dad at being 83 now would say, hurry up, you guys, like in my lifetime. I know. So, <laughs> yeah. But you've I made a lot of it. I haven't talked to him in a while. I want to get you two together. Yeah. That's a promise. Yeah. I, yeah, he would, he would love to talk to you. He, he wanted to talk to you a little bit about the FEI and what they're doing too, and, and loves your perspective yeah. on, you know, some of the things that are going on now. Tell me about this, this new, executive director position. So you're executive director at the Animal Wellness Action. What's changed in your life? What I mean, you're still in Washington, D.C. What do you do differently now? So now in my previous role, I, I went and worked in Congress for a while for Congressman Whitfield and worked on animal protection issues and as his communications director and then went to the Humane Society there for about two and a half years and worked on equine issues. And now I'm doing much broader work. So I work on Uh, everything from ending the slaughter and consumption of dogs and cats in America to uh, um, banning uh, animal fighting in the U.S. territories. Uh, I also work on issues uh, related to horse racing and the drugging in that industry. And just yesterday, we were fortunate enough to have, after a year and a half uh, worth of work, uh, three pieces of legislation included in the Farm Bill that passed both the House and the Senate and it passed the House yesterday and is now uh, headed to the president's desk. And uh, the Dog and Cat Meat Trade Prohibition Act, 
okay. the Pet and Women's Safety Act and the Parity and Animal Cruelty Enforcement Act were all three included in the Farm Bill. So it's something we have been focused on and may just be the best farm bill for animal protection in modern history. Wow. Um, so it, it's a much broader spectrum now, but I'm, I'm enjoying it. And I, I started out on this journey to end the soaring of two or 3,000 horses in the mm -hmm. world and have fortunately had the opportunity to pass legislation that has impacted millions of animal lives. Wow. I am so proud to know you, Marty Irby. That's really exciting. It's, it's so great that people recognized your passion, too. So now, do you ever get to ride? I don't. Unfortunately, oh. that's something I miss so much. I, for the past four or five years, I had gone to a horse show in, in Northern California around Sacramento called Mayfest and had helped them out just as a volunteer and would ride a horse or go trail riding once a year there. And I missed this past year. So I probably, ha unfortunately, have not ridden a horse in about two years and I miss it dearly. But hopefully I'll be able to carve some time out in the near future. That's right. It sounds like you're getting stuff accomplished so that you have to put up on your refrigerator or your, your dream board or whatever you keep as like, get me back in the saddle. That's where I got started in this whole journey. And, and you know, you owe it to yourself. Those horses are therapeutic, you know. Absolutely. I, I really miss it and am planning on doing that. I do um, get to attend a lot of equine events, though, through my work um, to end the doping and horse racing, I've yeah. been fortunate to work with the jockey club and a lot of those organizations and go to a lot of the, the races and see things up close. So I, I am at least around horses. Yeah, it's and good. That's, uh, that's wonderful good. too. Yeah, yeah, it, it is good. So pretty exciting. Executive director of uh, Animal Wellness Action. W what kind of direction is the mission statement, and where are you going with it? Is it so just animal really, welfare? Uh, it is. It's animal protection, and we, we're pretty simple. We just believe that helping animals helps us all, as is evident in our work with the Pet and Women's Safety Act. Um, that's a bill that would provide funding for uh, victims of domestic violence to be able to help them retain their pets and keep their pets. So we're helping animals, but we're really helping people and mankind and our society as well. And Staying focused on Capitol Hill on the federal level, on federal legislation and federal regulations, we have branched off into a few measures related to various state legislatures and even a cot fighting ban in Ventura, Cal Ventura mm -hmm. County, California yeah, uh, last week, but um, mainly yeah. focused on the federal level. Okay, well, good. So I want to, that's, that's the subject I think I want to take off with you and, and dad going forth because we're running a few programs now to help children. That one's called Lead Up. And actually, we're right in the middle of the clinic right now. We spent the last two days with the kids. They're about 14, 13, 16 years old. And we're working with them in the round pin with the join up and, and uh, human to human join ups. Oh, wow. You know, it's really cool. And then since 2010, we've been doing Horse Sense and Healing, which is our uh, first responders, veterans, and uh, and uh, people with post-traumatic stress. And so, yeah, you guys have a lot of traction, a lot of uh, same sameness between horses, therapy, and people. So I'll have to get you together for our next conversation. You, are you up for that? Absolutely. Right. I am definitely right. up for it. I'd love to talk to him and be involved and, and really appreciate that. We actually also worked on an appropriation this year to the Veterans Appropriation to help increase the dollars that are utilized for equine partnerships and wow. veterans with post-traumatic stress. So that's something we should talk about another time, but um, I think I that's too. ever increasing and, and a big thing on the horizon. That's awesome. Yes, I'd love to talk to you about that. And I probably have to thank you for that because I have been watching press releases on on some of that money is finally loosening up for alternative therapies, if you want to call it that. But uh, we all know it that's works. Right. So. <laughs> Yeah. It oh, wonderful. Does. Wonderful. Thank you again, Marty, for carving out some time. I know it's a congratulatory day. So thank you for taking some time to uh, speak to us and catching us up. And I want you to go home and celebrate and get on a horse. <laughs> well, I will. And I, I greatly appreciate you, Debbie, and the opportunity to be here and talk today. And I'm so thankful for your friendship over the years and all that you and your dad and mom have done for the horses. You've just done so much tremendous work that has impacted so many equine lives. Um, I applaud you as well. Thank you very much. And thanks for being on Horsemanship Radio, Marty. Hi, Carol Herter here, president of Cavallo, home of the world's most trusted and popular hoof boots. 
You know, one of the most interesting parts of what I do is the many horsey stories I get to hear. Most of them are really uplifting. Some are stories of challenges, and a few are downright sad. Recently, a wonderful woman took the time to approach us at a show to share a story about her horse who went down in quicksand. It started out as a really scary story. We were holding our breaths, waiting for the outcome, and it turned out wonderful. They winched the horse out relatively unscathed, albeit, you know, a little traumatized, and everyone standing around were super amazed that he still had his cavallo hoof boots on. Scary story with a good ending. Another testament to Cavallo. If you don't have a pair for your horse, it's time. Cavallos are easy to put on, easy to take off when you want to take them off, and they stay on. They stay on in all terrain. Cavallo, the world's most trusted hoof boots. Horse and Hound magazine named Monty Roberts as one of the top 50 all-time greatest horsemen. He's the creator of the world-renowned and revolutionary equine training technique called Join Up. Monty travels the world demonstrating that nonviolent, gentle training creates breakthrough performance as you partner with your horse. Growing up on a working horse farm, Monty witnessed traditional, often violent methods of horse training and breaking the spirit with an abusive hand. Rejecting that, he went on to win nine world's championships in the show ring. Today, Monty's goal is to share his message that violence is never the answer. Monty is credited with launching the first of its kind, Equus Online University. It's an interactive online lesson site that is the definitive learning tool for violence-free training. And we have with him Jamie Jennings. Jamie Jennings is the host of the popular podcast Horses in the Morning on the Horse Radio Network. Jamie has lived all over the country as a military wife and spent the last 10 years in Arizona. She competes in the sport of three-day eventing and has completed all across the country. Her favorite thing is transitioning horses off the racetrack to their second careers and also has a deep love for Mustangs. She had been training horses and people for years, but upon seeing Monty's methods at a demonstration, she wanted to learn more. From there, she was able to travel the Flag is Up Farms multiple times, spending ample time with Monty and all the wonderful instructors there. She received her certification in the summer of 2018. Jamie and her husband, Chad, relocated their facility, Flyover Farm, to Norman, Oklahoma, in the fall of 2018, and now she offers Monty's courses, too. Well, welcome. I've got two prestigious horse trainers on with me right now. This is going to be fun. I've got Jamie Jennings in person, and I have Monty Roberts in his bedroom. Hello. (laughs) So we're working this out. We're all on the farm, and we're working out where we can talk to each other without talking to each other, but we ended up figuring it out, and I'm really excited because the fact that they're on the farm together tells you that they were out there working with horses together. And I thought I wanted to hear about this because we've been seeing some Facebook posts and and we know it's Mustangville around here. So they're working with a, a Mustang named Diego. And Dad, do you want to give a little background on Diego? Oh, I can give some background on Diego. Uh, that's no problem. And probably a lot of your listeners have seen him and so forth, but something happened in the last month or so that caused Diego to be very hard to catch in the field. And I was a hundred days on the road, only getting the messages. So I told them, leave him alone, but I don't think they did leave him alone. And um, I got reports that they tried to catch him for three hours and couldn't catch him. And I said, just please leave him alone. And I want to get home. But I want to tell you, Debbie, that I am so excited about this particular interview or audio that you cannot believe the excitement that's within me. And we just had some trouble with the lines. And I thought, oh, no, don't lose this one. I want to desperately uh, do this interview. And um, the reason is many. The reasons are many. It is incredible what has happened to me in the last six months. And I want to tell you how important this is. I am missing an episode of Gunsmoke to do this. Oh, so sorry about that. Jamie knows how important that is. And Jamie's father even knows how important that is. Uh, And I'm happy to do it because I've discovered something that's happened to me in the last six months 
that is overwhelmingly exciting for me if in fact I can take it anywhere else. But something has happened in the area of a culmination of muscle memory in the language equus that I cannot even believe. I have been on the road for a hundred days, as I said, and that amounted to about a hundred horses. It amounted to about a hundred horses because there were 30 some for the queen. And then there was almost 20 for Gestut Verhoff in Germany. And then I had uh, nine separate demonstrations. So it's a hundred, maybe 110 horses that I worked with. And you cannot believe how incredibly positive these demonstrations were. Something has happened inside of me, which is a culmination of muscle memory that has taught me the language of equus that scares me to death. Why? And the reason it scares me is I have to now desperately try to teach this in conscious terms to students that don't have 83 years to log it to muscle memory. Uh, they're, they're not going to use 83 years to log it to muscle memory. I've got to learn how to put this across. And Jamie is the first student, really, that I've had since returning that was able to see this thing happen. Here is a horse that could not be caught. Seven people, they told me, were in the catch pen, which is about a quarter of an acre, uh, catch pen, trying to catch him. And they spent three hours and gave up on several occasions. He could not be caught. And he was very, very dangerous in that his effort to not be caught was to line up on somebody and run right at them. And he just bowls them over. He just knocks them out of the way and bowls them over. This was his attempt when he was extra wild before he went through the clinic about two years ago. And then something happened that put him back to square one. And I said to Jamie, I think I have the answer. And I, I met the horse in the field and it was just like a zoo. I mean, he ran and you couldn't get near him. You, I couldn't get within 50 yards of him. And that was in a two and a half acre field. And then they were run into the catch pen, which is about a quarter of an acre. And I couldn't get near him in there. Jamie was in there with me, sort of crouched by a feeder. And he <laughs> was buzzing around there like a motorcycle in a barrel. And there was no getting near him. And each move that I made was somewhere coming out of my middle in a thing called muscle memory. And pretty soon I showed Jamie how I remembered that he would let me throw a rope over his back and over his hips. And I threw that rope over his back and over his hips several times. And I could watch him start to remember that I'm okay. That when that particular action took place two years ago, he got better and he allowed me to come and touch him. So in this instance, I watched him hearken back or take it up out of his muscle memory that I was okay. Pretty soon I'm scratching his withers and walking away not putting a halter on him or a rope or anything, just scratching his withers and walking away. And when I went back, boom, he's gone again. And this went on for an hour and 15 minutes, but at the conclusion of that hour and 15 minutes, was it an hour and 15, Jamie? Yes, sir. At the conclusion of the hour and 15 minutes, I could catch him, put a halter on him, and lead him out of the catch pen comfortably. And Jamie and I worked out the time. What was the total time we've worked it with him now on a three-day period? The three days was three hours and 15 minutes. Okay, so it took them three hours, and they couldn't catch him. And we worked three hours and 15 minutes. And I promise you that Jamie and I both caught him, and probably our count 
of catchings was 50 or 60 <laughs> times that we caught him. And in the end, we had him waiting for us at the gate where we could go in and put the halter on him. Now, this can't happen, but it did. And I tell you it did because the inner muscle memory kicked in and I knew the gestures to make. I knew the directions to go. I I knew where my eyes were, where my shoulders, where my fingers, hands, arms were. It is a magical thing. I've known it was magical for, for 50 years, 60 years now. But I didn't know how magical it was. And I think, Jamie, I'm going to put her on now. I think she would be the closest thing I could make to a heavenly judgment from the sky of what I did. Jamie, what did you see? I saw a horse that was dangerous, really, really, really dangerous and really afraid. I mean, he was dangerous because he was afraid. Something in his life has happened to him and and he has not had a a bunch of really positive experiences with humans in the last six months since he's been kind of out and being a, a babysitter. So he hasn't even seen that many people. And when he did see people, it was seven guys trying to catch him in a in a catch pen there. And I, and I saw a man, you walk out there and just act like you had all the time in the world. And when you go out to catch a horse, I think that struck me as the kind of demeanor and the relaxation and the core that you kind of carry, which is like, just a relaxed approach to going out there. It was not, I'm going to run out there and catch him and bring him in. It was, I'm going to run out there and I'm just going to walk around and you take your time. And if I can rub you great, and then I'll walk away. And so using, uh, the approach and retreat and patience of Job, uh, you were able to, to get him caught and, um, you know, catching your horse is, is one part of your day, but you know, you don't want to struggle with catching your horse. You want to walk out there and catch your horse. So guess what? We had to practice. We had to practice and practice and practice teaching Diego how to be caught. And, um, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to, to sit here with you for three days. I, I think as weird as it sounds, my, I think my favorite thing to do is just walk in, catch the horse and walk out and just take that as a day and activity is just my favorite thing to do. So it was definitely a pleasure being around you and just watching your demeanor and watching your patience level. And we, you know, I I've learned enough here now that I'm a certified instructor to not let your adrenaline get up and not let your adrenaline get the best of you because your adrenaline level only affects the horse. So as Diego's running around and I'm standing by the feeder and you're in the middle, neither one of us got upset. Neither one of us got tense. Neither one of us got stressed. And we just let him have his activity. And when he was, when he had relaxed and lowered his adrenaline, that's when the learning started. Yeah, it was, it was incredible for me. And my whole trip on this particular autumn my whole trip for that hundred days was filled with horses like this. And I just couldn't do it wrong. Everything was going right for me. And we put in, I think, several of the top five kind of demonstrations that I've ever done. And uh, Debbie, you'll be amused by this because we had a situation occur today that was quite amusing, really. Um, we were catching Diego in various places over by the quarter horse barn and in a small pen and then down in the catch pen and out in the field and so forth and so on. Well, today was a day where we moved backwards right out through small area, then bigger area than the field, you know, and we went out to the field and what do you think they put in the field before we got there next to Diego and Tucker, two Mustangs, they put three horses with blankets on of varying splashy colors. And one of them had a zebra blanket on. And they went sailing around their field and 
Diego went nuts. His tail was straight in the air, and he flew around there. And I thought, oh, my word, I will never get him caught. And they flew around that field, obviously very frightened by or amused by or something, I don't know, these three horses that fell out of the sky. They came from outer space. They were definite aliens. Yeah, they haven't seen a zebra before, so I mean, no, it was they never these were seen a zebra, before. and 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 I swear to you, I thought somebody put a zebra in the field. As it's, I saw um, it. yeah, these are full cover fly sheets, head to tail, like completely. One is a couple of them are just white, and the other one is zebra print, and yeah, it looks. I thought there was a zebra out there. I was like, who did that? <laughs> Well, certainly, certainly Diego thought there was, I tell you, and they ran down and went in the catch pen and it was almost as though T Tucker, both Tucker and Diego were saying, please come get me, let me get close to you. <laughs> and they were, they were circling around us, you know, and, uh, we were suddenly their best friends. Um, <laughs> the whole thing worked. You couldn't put it on paper. You could not possibly dream up a set of circumstances that would be more positive in the learning curve of horsemanship than this was. It was overwhelming. And I know, I know that I can do things now. Uh, this recent horse called Pakistan star won four and a half million dollars after a two day visit from me when he had been banned from racing globally. And uh, there's a horse in Australia that they haven't brought me yet that won't break from the starting gate. He just, won't go. The rest of the field goes and he goes. Now, this is a horse that earned nine million dollars in racing and he won't leave the gate. Nine million dollars. He's the winningest sprinter in the history of the thoroughbred breed. And he's finished. He's banned for life in Australia. And the owners are meeting, I think, today. Uh, isn't that right, Debbie? Yeah. So uh, there's Chautauqua, who is the one banned from Australia, and then Pakistan Star was Hong Kong, and he's he's being put up for a possible ban. He's not banned yet. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So and and and, and these are the kind of horses I get, and right. normal human beings, and I'm not going to call them bad people. I'm not going to say they are not good horsemen. In fact, uh, both of them are Hall of Fame. That's horsemen. right. That's right. Both of them, Hall of Fame horsemen that are training these. And, I, I, you know, I'm not going to say they're bad people or they have bad intentions, but they haven't learned what I've learned. That's right. And when you put it to your muscle memory, when you can't get it wrong, mm -hmm. there is a feeling that goes through your middle that is overwhelming. And Debbie and I are both so excited because we're being an off offered a position to select horses for a, uh, a man and um, and good things are coming our way mm -hmm. lots of good things are coming our way and yeah, that's well and good but yeah, at 83 like, there's I, no I was going to I was going to say at 83 so you didn't get into the horse business until you were how old 3 3 okay and so we got you figured out before that so you said at the top of this that something scared you that you feel this responsibility to pass it on. So you talk a lot about core, and I think this is what you are recognizing in Jamie. We put up on Facebook, too, if people can find this again, but you know how hard Facebook is to find these posts. But we did put up some posts of you and Jamie working together on Diego in the paddock, the smaller paddock anyway, and you talked a lot about core. And so how do you convey or to Jamie, even a certified instructor. I know you're still yeah. teaching. Yeah, but you know, in Jamie's case, uh, several things apply. Number one, she went through all the courses. And number two, she heard a lot from me about diaphragmatic breathing and re learning to relax and knowing what your body is all about as you work with horses. She, 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 you know, she was experiencing this as she went through the classes. Not that I knew then what I know now, because it's the last six months have just been overwhelming. But there was a good start there. And then in addition to that, Jamie has horses of her own. 
and she helps other young people that are coming along with their horses and works with some remedial horses. So she was well on her way. What I need is to be able to take the Jamies of the world and crank this up so that I can teach them these things in a reasonable period of time and that they can learn them not just organically through experience, but academically that we know what's happening so we can teach it to them. I got to figure out what's happening inside of me so that I know how to impart that to these students. And I'm Mm going to try. I'm really going to try. And Jamie's a good place for me to start. And and Joe from Wales is another uh, spot for me because and 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 Simon Stokes in Germany. These are all yeah. students of mine that have particular talents to get it right. F- pretty cl- close, you know, um, just from their own birth condition, their own bodies, and from their in- intuitive kind of uh, mm-hmm. uh, learning. Mm -hmm. And also from a desire to learn. They really want to learn this. So if you have those ingredients there, then the more I can teach them, the easier it will be for them to teach the next generation who may not be born with attributes that are unusual. Just normal people can learn this. We have to learn what the (laughs) heck it is they're learning. Yeah, well, I, I think what you're you're really referring to is physiology. Some people are just a little more even tempered and less, you know, frantic around horses than others. But you can teach you you say things like moving in heavy oil, and you teach diaphragmatic breathing. Um, so one of one of the things that I think people must be dying to hear right now were what were some of the procedures? And I know Jamie talked to, uh, on hit him on the horses in the morning on the horse radio network on December 12th, I believe would be the day if you look back, but she talked a lot about the procedures, but Jamie, would you give us a little bit about, give them a hint so that they don't, uh, you know, leave us wanting here. Um, sure. You know, Teaching the to Diego to be caught was was a challenge because once we even did catch him, he was very very nervous. But I think one of Monty's ways to teach them, you know, we don't we don't give horses food from our hand, so you have to come up with a different way to teach the horse that there is a a happy place once they're caught. And so, what we did, um, what he did, and I just helped uh, basically was. We took a bucket, a tiny little rubber feed tub, and put a handful of grain, just a tiny little minuscule handful of grain in the bucket. Once we finally got Diego caught, which if you're trying this at home, you know, have the help. What we had is the help of Tucker, a a nice gentle gelding to kind of help us get closer to Diego. So once you get your horse caught, we let him out and, you know, we, we, we decided to we decided to brush him. So we, we wrapped the rope around the hitching post and I went back to get the brushes and, and Diego was like, what, what is this thing on the ground? There's a, there's some food here. Oh my gosh, I'm going to steal it. I'm going to steal it before they get back. And so he stole this food and I came back and I brushed him for a second and I thought, Oh, I got to go do something else. So I put him back in the pasture and then I realized, Oh, I got to go get him. I got to finish brushing him. So I went back out and got him and put him back up to the hitching post. Didn't tie him straight time, just looped it through. And lo and behold, that dang bucket of grain is there again. Just a little handful, just enough to get him excited. So he reached down and he snatched that up and he stole it. And then he was like, where are they? Okay. And I came back and I brushed him and then I thought, oh, I got to go back and do something else. I forgot. And so I then went and put him back out in the pasture in that little catch pen. And then I realized, Oh, I got to go get him again. So I, I went back out there and got him again. Meanwhile, somebody like Monty has put a tiny little handful of grain back in there. And we went out and got him again this time, instead of having to walk all the way to the back of the paddock, he's about halfway up and he's interested. And then I come to the gate and so does he. And I catch him and I take him out and I put him on the hitching post and gosh, darn it. There's grain again. And he snatches that up and he steals it. And then I go brush him and put him back out in the field. 
Well, the next time, you know, we did this, Monty and I did it for three days, you know, 50, 60 times. He's learned that when he gets caught, he comes up and there's something he can steal. We, we didn't tell him it was there, but he found it and it was his. So it kind of became his, his idea to be caught. And so today, this morning, Debbie, we go out and he is standing by the dang gate right. waiting for us to come and get him. And yep, we got him, put him out, got some brushes and wait a second, there's some green down there. I'm going to steal it. And we did this and we did it so many times. And now we turned him out in that big field. And when he came, you know, running back in for safety from the ferocious zebra, we put the lead rope on him and walked him out. And I sat by the truck and what the heck? There was some grain on the ground in that little tiny rubber bucket. So that's kind of how the procedure that we used to continue to catch him. Obviously, two people is nice because that one of us was bringing in the horse and putting him out while the other one was somehow leaving a little handful of green in the bucket. How did I do explaining that, Monty? Was that okay? Well, well really good, uh, Jamie. Very good. And Jamie's story was told uh, as a drama that <laughs> she, she really knew that she was going to go back and get him. She didn't just say, I forgot something. Yes, um, but he didn't that, know that. that. But, but that. But that's the attitude that she had. And he didn't know that. And so he just saw her acting in a natural way that maybe she forgot something. So she's putting me back in the field now. And then here she comes again. And one thing Jamie didn't tell you is that I showed her how Pavlov worked four mm-hmm. 500 years ago. And uh, you take the snap and ring it on the gate. Ding, 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 ding. And the chain rings on the gate. And then you catch him. And then when you come back to catch him the next time, you ring it again and you catch him and he gets this little stolen uh, one ounce of of sweet feed. And um, each time that thing rings, his tendency will be to come toward the gate because good things happen when they catch me. Now, a lot of people might catch a horse and by the time they get him caught, because he was difficult, They're very angry, so they pull him around and tell him how horrible he is and saddle him up and ride him uh, 10 miles. Uh, Where's the good stuff in that getting caught? So we reversed that, and this is several horses that I've done this with, but this is the best one I've ever done. We made it so that there was a good thing that happened once he got caught, and it isn't food from the hand. He wasn't looking to us to bite us or close because we fed him from the hand. He just stole a little bit of grain, just a few kernels of grain from the bottom of a rubber tub. And that's good enough. It's just a positive experience from being caught. Right. And, and I, uh, I like that you, I like treat. that you, you groomed on him too. I mean, that's another positive that you, you threw in there, but that's gotta be another, um, plus for him. I'm most horses yeah. like and, a little and, spa and moment. Debbie, you could also call it a marker. You know, right. It's a marker. It's what happens when you get caught. It's, it feels good to be brushed and, uh, it feels good to eat a few kernels of grain and then they put me back out and then they repeat the process and they didn't run me 10 miles or put a whip against me in violence. Um, it was all very positive. And as, so long as we do that, even when we intend to saddle him and ride him, he just gets a few kernels of grain in the bottom of a tub. So long as we do that, he will remain an easy horse to catch for the rest of his life. And mm-hmm. the people that had trouble catching him, whoever that was, some guys that work for us or something, I don't know. But they would say, oh, you know, Namby Pamby, any horse ought to just be caught. So... They'd be upset about it, you know. No no reason to get upset about it. It's his decision. And uh, we gave him a reason to decide our way instead of the way that he wanted to escape from whatever it was that he didn't like about them. Right. And, and I do, I like the point where people will go, you spent three hours and 15 minutes teaching your horse to be caught. What a waste of time. And I I think, well, you're spending three hours each time trying to get your dang horse and then you ride it. So I feel like, 
<laughs> yeah, for the life of the horse, you know, you may spend three plus hours a week trying to catch it. So if you take the time and do the homework, you know, I think that's what I've stressed with my students the most is you have this problem. I will offer you a solution with a nonviolent method, but you know what? It's not going to happen instantaneously. You have to put in the time and do the work. And to me, three hours of teaching a horse and going in and out and catching and releasing, catching, releasing, catching, releasing three hours is nothing compared to the lifetime of the horse that you struggle to catch forever and ever. Yeah. And, and, and Jamie, it was fun, wasn't it? I have had the best thing three days I've had in a long time, Monty. It was ja so much fun to watch him learning. You know, and it isn't like, unlike children, if you see a child learning, you can sit for hours and watch them grow and heap energy to learning something. This horse was learning so quickly that it was entertaining to both of us. We were mm -hmm. transfixed by his improvement and it's fun. So don't argue about the three, and a, three hours and 15 minutes to train him to be caught. It's fun. And we will have a lot more fun with this horse from this point forward because of the work that we did. It's funny, Monty, my husband, who's at home taking care of our farm, you know, he asked me at the end of the day, what'd you do today? Well, I, I caught a horse and then I let him go. And then I caught him again and to him, a non-horse person, a military guy. He's like, what? You mean you flew all the way to California to catch a dang horse? <laughs> yeah. It is hard for normal people to understand <laughs> some of these things, but um, you know, it isn't it isn't terribly unlike uh, raising a child, having a child learn certain things like that. If there's light at the end of the tunnel in the learning process, if they're having fun with it, if they're accomplishing something, and it turns out to be a positive experience for them, learning goes up. If it turns out to be drudgery, learning goes down. And and that's all we did. It's pretty darn simple when you stop and think about it. Well, it, it was it was simple and it was fun. And uh, thank you so much for teaching me. Oh, Jamie, any time I tell you I, I'd like to repeat something like this once a week, I'm not sure my old body could take it, but I <laughs> I loved every minute of it. Y'all should have seen Monty sprinting through the field the other day. I mean, it was awesome. It was impressive. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you both. Yeah, That's, yeah, it's a great story. It's it's a great um, version of the things that you all do. I know all the time, and and this applies. This isn't just if you don't have a horse that can't be caught. Uh, you know, forget about all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, you will eventually anyway. That's true. But also these these concepts that you're talking about apply for really any any kind of issue that you might run up against, or just a, a gut check, right? Yeah, and Debbie, you know. Most people that have horses will tell you catching isn't so difficult. It's the loading in the trailer or catching there isn't you so go. difficult. It's getting them to stand at the mounting block or things like that, you know. So there, there are things, any number of things, that confound the process of enjoying your horse. And if you just stop, take a breath, learn to diaphragmatic breathe, take it in stride and stay calm, figure out a way to make it as good for the horse as it is for you, the two of you will get along a lot better and have a lot more fun. Agreed. So are you, so we're three parts of a four part team running off to do a lead up clinic. Now are you excited about that? I am indeed. We have these kids coming that are like 12, 13 year old kids, uh, youth at risk here in this Santa Barbara County community of California. And it's so much fun to watch them learn. It's It's been really fun to teach them and watch the transformation of these at-risk youth when they lay their hands on a horse. And it, it, it's just been really awesome. And I, and I look forward to doing more lead-ups in the future and, and doing the military clinics. It's really amazing to watch horses transform and, and also to watch the people transform. So it, it kind of goes goes both ways, horses and humans. They just need to breathe, relax, and enjoy themselves, and, and, and life will get better. Well, thank you. Thank you both for being partners for the horse and for helping people get to know them a little bit more. Thank you both. Thank you for having us on, Debbie. Thank you. 
Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of... Dear Monty, I'm enrolled with your online university and am enjoying the lessons. I am new to horsemanship and do not yet own a horse. I found a ranch here in Southern California, LA area, to begin my real world lessons to handle horses. The current method is to start with a light hand and to increase the pressure until I get the horse to do what I want. Recently, my coaches told me to increase the pressure continue to kick the sides of the horse until he moves, as I want for a walk, trot, or lope. These are not light kicks, but very hard. I work up a sweat doing this. It feels violent as I'm doing the kicking, and my inner balance is upended. My frustration is growing. It feels wrong. I've watched other master trainers ride without kicking, and I'm being coached to do it to get the horse to cooperate or submit. It's gotten to the point that when I go to get the horse to prep for the lessons, I project his anticipation on seeing me as, oh no, it's him again, and he's already decided on his level of cooperation for the lesson. Then the lesson becomes an argument instead of a conversation. By the way, this adds to my hesitation of owning a horse along with other factors. I need some advice. Tom. Monty's answer. Dear Tom, wouldn't it be nice if every novice horseman read their horses the way you have? This description you have written outlines for me a set of principles all too often present in the world of traditional horsemanship dating back 6,000 years. What you have described is wrong. I haven't met your instructor, nor do I know for certain your description is absolutely correct. If it is a reasonable outline of what you are told to do, then it is dead wrong and you need help. Please accept my invitation to continue visiting lessons on the online university. And since Southern California is your home, have a hard look at the courses available on my farm in Solvang, California. Thank you for your interest and please stay in touch. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, Go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says, Get Free Horse Tips. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider, it doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum... And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, February 1 through 3. Starting right now as you listen to this is the introductory course, Module 1. And then February 8 to 10, there is the introductory course, Module 2. February 11 to 13 is the longlining course. February 15 to 17, that's the President's Day weekend there, is the Equine Facility Management Clinic, EFM through CHA. Then February 19 to 21 is the join-up course. February 22 to 24 is an introductory course, Module 3. February 20 to 24 is Norway. Monty's going to be in Norway at the Norwegian Horse Festival. And then March 1 to 3, we have a prep for the introductory exams. That'll be important. It's a part of completing your introductory course on to becoming an instructor in the Monty Roberts methods. And then March 4 through 6, we have the join up course. March 7 through 9, a long lining course. March 9 through 17, we have Monty over in Germany. He's at Equitana. That's the largest equine trade show on earth. And he'll be doing live demonstrations there. And then we'll stop here in April at April 29 and 30 is the movement. We spoke about that at the top of the segues here. And that will be at Flag is Up Farms in Solvang, California. It's a Monday and a Tuesday. So make sure you tell your boss you really need to be there because it's one of the most important events we do all year. That's very interesting how a lot of the things that you do at Flag is Up Farms, when you said tell your boss you need to be there, because Mm -hmm. they're applicable to everyday life 
and mm-hmm. everyday life in the workplace. That's right. Regardless of whether or not a horse has anything to do with what you do in your everyday life or in your work life. That's right. That's right. We take the middle management takes these back into their Monday office meetings. And we, we just have a lot of people that their, their vocation, you know, it funds their avocation, which are horses, but people know that there's just certain qualities about horses that really improve different things that they do in their life, whether it's familial relationships, whether it's uh, your job, your hobbies, uh, outside of horses even. It just makes you a better, I think horses make you a better person. There you go. So if someone is curious about improving their familial relationships, or Mm -hmm. if there's someone who has um, people they work with that work for them, Mm -hmm. that are curious about how some of these programs could help their business, they could call somebody at Flag Is Up Farms and you guys could help them out. Absolutely. We put groups together all year long. And so, yeah, they call it 805-688-6288 and just say, hey, I want to learn more about learning about horses. There you go. And, and how those can apply to my, to my work life or, cause I, I'm just imagining there are people listening to the show who, you know, they run barrels or they're mm-hmm. a amateur owner eventer, or right. they have backyard trail horses, but they also own four McDonald's restaurants and they're going, right. <laughs> wait a minute, I could, I could create better yes. restaurant managers if they can take some of these courses because it's about being a good leader. That is so true. I mean, everybody knows that it works around horses, that it's a leadership uh, skill set that you really need to master to to uh, be a good horse trainer. But if uh, if people thought about corporate trainings, uh, you know, that they've done experiential things, corporate events, we do those. We've done those since the 80s, believe it or not. And uh, we have a lot of fun with it. And we've had probably every corporation you've ever can think of off the top of your head. Over 500 corporations have come through wow. and done corporate training. Yeah. And corporate events. So sometimes Ooh. they're like, um, sometimes they're like a, a, you know, a gift to their top management, mm-hmm. you know, and they get to come and have fun and they always leave going, wow, this is take home. I thought I was just coming to have a barbecue and see, you know, a guy train horses who's an author and, and, you know, it'd be an experiential thing. And it is, but they always go home saying, you know what, I've got this 17 year old daughter at home. Who's I, I'm going to go try this again. <laughs> you know, yeah, gonna, yeah. They're split. struggling with their relationship because it's yes. in transition and they could take that home and make it better. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. cool. And mm-hmm. if you couldn't get all that in your memory banks while you drive down the road or clean the stall, as you listen to the show, you can also go to montyroberts.com and get all that same information along with the phone number. And for details about today's show, you can go to horsemanshipradio.com where you'll find links, photos, more information about the guests and topics. And you're going to go to horsemanshipradio.com and you're going to look for episode 128. That'll make it quick and easy. And we love your feedback. It helps us get new ideas for the show. See, Debbie does this show a lot. So sometimes the idea file is a little (laughs) empty. So if you're just, you're jonesing to hear about a topic or hear from some really influential and amazing person making the horse world better, drop Mm -hmm. her a line, go to Facebook, Monty Roberts, look for the one that has the little blue check mark. That's the official one. And write Mm -hmm. it on there. You can drop her an email at horsemanshipradio.com. You can also follow Monty on Twitter. If you're one of those folks, it's Monty underscore Roberts. And he's totally new and relevant. He's on Instagram. That's right. He's Monty on Instagram. Underscore yeah. Roberts IG. App. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and get the Horse Radio Network app so you don't miss any shows of the Horsemanship Radio or any other. You can get it by going to your app store and searching Horse Radio Network. Download it today. It's free and easy to use for your Android or iPhone. And for the less tech savvy folks in your life, Give them a hand and help them download it. And you can also find the Horse Radio Network shows, including Horsemanship Radio, on your favorite podcatcher. Right. Very good. It's like put on your mask and then you can put on the person's next to you. Right. Okay. So many (laughs) thanks to our sponsors, too. You're killing me today. (laughs) Omega Fields. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, And Cavallo Horse and Rider and Monty Roberts University. Be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Network.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours.